He didn't touch me. Shock claims about what Jackson's accuser told a teacher. Army bullying, a damning report into the care of new recruits. Finding Millie's killer, police herald a major breakthrough. Red tape proud, the top cop who's giving the government a headache. And Tim Heyman makes it through to the last 16 at Indian Wells. Also tonight, send him off, the ref's red card for Mourinho. Sky News with Steve Dixon and Paula Middlehurst. Hey, good evening to you. The evidence in the Michael Jackson trial has taken another dramatic turn today with the pop star's young accuser in the witness stand once again. Gavin Arvizo is being questioned by defence lawyer Thomas Mesereau. Well, the 15-year-old has admitted to telling a teacher that Michael Jackson did not abuse him. The conversation is said to have taken place just after the controversial Martin Bashir documentary had aired. Well, Sky's Ian Doverston is outside the courtroom in Santa Maria. And uh, just what was the reaction in the court, Ian, when this uh, was finally admitted? Well, the reaction of the court, it's a very well-behaved court and the judge is watching everything, actually, and there is a lecture, actually, given usually before court about uh, reactions within the court and within the, the public area, so it's fairly mooted, actually, but that gives you no idea of, of what a bombshell was dropped during the evidence. Uh, I think everybody views it as that, that he would tell this teacher uh, quite what he did, that there was no sexual contact between himself and Michael Jackson, um, clearly it will have impacted on the jury and that's what Thomas Mesereau has been trying to do and if we think about this uh, this court Thomas Mesereau said to Gavin Arvizo in that witness stand at some point during that conversation and this is a conversation between um, the Dean of the school and himself Gavin Arvizo at some point during that conversation with Dean Arpert he looked you in the eyes and said are these allegations that Michael Jackson abused you true and Gavin Arvizo said um, yes that's what happened he looked me in the eye and said that Mesereau said uh, and you said they were not true, right? Which would have been consistent now. But Gavin said, I told him that Michael Jackson did not do anything. Now, of course, that is completely different with the evidence that he now gives us uh, in court, has testified today and has testified uh, during last week. Absolutely different. But it is, however, consistent with his line of the time, if you like. It was after the Martin Bashir documentary. Um, uh, the uh, allegations that are now in court only surfaced when he went to a psychologist. This meeting with the teacher was before that, uh, and they were consistent with what he said in a rebuttal video, a very glowing account of, of Michael Jackson. And also, I guess, coming into play as well is uh, how uh, keen would somebody who's been abused uh, be to tell his headmaster at the time. But what we do uh, think will happen, of course, is when Tom Snedden, the prosecutor, gets back up on his feet, he will clear this point up in re-examination. Because, of course, Thomas Mesereau's job is not to find out why he said that, just to put that before the jury. But Tom Snedden will now be keen. I'm sure he's got it in his notes in front of him, his many notes. He'll now be keen to put that to uh, Gavin Arvizo again and get what was the background at that time to him saying that to his headmaster. Ian Doverson, thank you very much indeed. Well, we're using actors to recreate the vital moments of the Michael Jackson trial throughout our coverage here on Sky News. You can see a special half-hour programme, Tuesday to Saturday, right here on this channel, 9.30 in the morning, repeated again in the afternoon at 2.30. That's Tuesday to Saturday, a reconstruction of the trial of the century on Sky News. That's just bringing some breaking news from the Middle East, carried by the Reuters newswire. And that is that Israel has announced it's to hand over the West Bank city of Jericho to the Palestinians on Wednesday. This coming Wednesday, Jericho will be handed back over to the Palestinians. This had been, of course, a point of contention between the two. This move to hand over various towns, including Jericho, uh, Tulkam, uh, Kalkilia, Ramallah and Bethlehem, um, was all dependent on whether the militants could be controlled by the new Palestinian president, Mahmoud Abbas. There was then some concern over the past few weeks with... Um, uh, the Israeli Prime Minister Ariel Sharon saying that there, that may not now go uh, according to that uh, original schedule. But we are now being told by Israeli Army Radio that Jericho will be handed over on Wednesday. Tulkam is expected to come next in the following few days, but no specific timetable for that as we understand it at this time. 
but say Jericho to be handed over to the Palestinians on Wednesday. It's a very important first step in this whole process. More on that, of course, throughout the evening here on Sky News. Sinn Féin's Martin McGuinness has warned the family of Robert McCartney to back off. He said the campaign to bring the killers to justice could be left open to political manipulation. The sisters, though, are taking their campaign to Washington, where they'll meet George Bush and Hillary Clinton. We're live to our correspondent in Washington, David Blevins. And David, clearly this is uh, an important move forward, uh, certainly on behalf of the uh, McCartney sisters. But how is this going to play out in terms of Sinn Féin's political standing in the United States? Well, I think for the very first time, Steve, uh, Irish Republicans would appear to be out of step to some extent with Irish America. They don't come more Irish American than Senator Ted Kennedy. His decision to refuse Jerry Adams' request for a meeting has cer certainly sent a shockwave through Sinn Féin. The party has suffered its most crushing blow, I suppose, yet in its attempt to limit the damage being done by events on the other side of the Atlantic, events like the murder of Robert McCartney and prior to that, the Northern Bank robbery. Uh, why has Martin McGuinness told the McCartney sisters to back off? It's a strong phrase, if, if that is the phrase verbatim. Um, why this move? Because up until now Sinn Féin has said that it has been sort of working with the police, or at least attempting to, uh, and pushing this forward rather than back. Well, I'm not exactly sure that he used the term back off. I think his comments are open to all sorts of interpretation. But uh, Republicans are clearly rattled by the intensity of this crisis and by the enormous campaign mounted by the McCartney sisters. Let's face it, they're going to raise their case for justice at the highest level this Thursday when they meet with President Bush himself. The day prior to that, they will be meeting with Senators Ted Kennedy and Hillary Clinton. So clearly they are making an impact and that's causing Sinn Féin a problem. But of equal concern to Sinn Féin is the suggestion from Paula McCartney that she may stand against Sinn Féin in the Northern Ireland Assembly elections when they come around. And just today, the suggestion from Catherine McCartney, another sister, that she may challenge Gerry Adams for his West Belfast seat in the general election. Now, what Martin McGuinness is saying is that for them to cross that line into party politics may do a huge disservice to their campaign for justice and make people begin to question what this campaign is all about, while they insist, of course, it's about simply finding some witnesses who will come forward and make sure Robert's killers are brought to justice. David, thanks very much indeed. Well, there's still a chance to have your say in today's uh, Sky News Active Vote. Uh, we're asking, is George Bush right or not to meet Gerry Adams? If you'd like to vote on that question, press the red button on your remote control to access the Sky News Active poll. Now, shocking and catastrophic. That's how a damning report today described the failings of military commanders at Deep Cut and other army training camps. The Defence Select Committee said radical changes were now needed. It recommended the army considers raising the minimum recruiting age to 18. And also that an independent military complaints commission is set up to deal with allegations of bullying. But the committee didn't support the idea of an independent inquiry into the Deep Cut deaths. OK, the first target that we've got here, then, all right, is a figure 11, which is mounted on a witness screen. Most of these young recruits aren't old enough to drink alcohol or vote, yet they're being trained in the use of deadly weapons. It's a high-pressure time for these teenagers. They have enough to cope with without having to worry about bullying. Take this in away! Yet MPs on the Defence Select Committee say bullying remains an issue. In fact, it's underreported. They're calling for a change in culture where intimidation is no longer tolerated and an independent body to oversee bullying complaints. If you have a, a more open culture, uh, then people who are being bullied or have complaints will feel less intimidation uh, by going outside the chain of command. For far too long, the inquiry concludes, the welfare of young recruits has not received the attention it deserves. The MPC, the Army in particular, now needs to grasp the nettle of their duty of care. The report was prompted by a string of tragedies at the deep-cut Army base in Surrey. What exactly happened within the barbed wire fences at Deep Cut Barracks that resulted in the deaths of four young recruits? Their parents blame a culture of bullying and intimidation, but ten years on from the first death, there are still no firm answers. 
Private Jeff Gray was just 17 when he died of two gunshot wounds to the head. His parents say today's report backs their claims that senior officers failed in their duty of care towards their son and other recruits. I think it just strengthens our case once again for a public inquiry. If the system failed Jeff, we need to know why the system failed Jeff, and we need to fix that system. The Armed Forces Minister says he'll carefully consider the report's conclusions. We will do what is required to be done because of the, the care uh, and the, the responsibility that we have for those young men and women who join the Armed Forces it ranks very high. Concerned that the very young struggle to cope with the rigours of military life, the Select Committee is calling on the MOD to look at the implications of raising the entry age from 16 to 18. Like Private Jeff Gray, three of the four recruits who died at Deep Cut were just 17. Mark White, Sky News. Police hunting the killer of 13-year-old Millie Dowler believe they've made a major breakthrough. So Millie disappeared three years ago this month. Her body was found six months later. Well, now officers investigating her murder are planning to release new CCTV footage of a red car spotted yards from where she was last seen alive. Well, Sky's Barbara Serra has been to Walton-on-Thames, where Millie was last seen. It's almost three years to the day since Millie Dowler disappeared just yards away from here, Walton Station, and Surrey police seem to think they might finally have found a breakthrough. Tomorrow they'll release CCTV footage of a car which was seen parked and driving away from the area minutes after Millie Dowler disappeared. The CCTV footage has been enhanced by the FBI in the United States and it shows a red Daewoo Nexia, an NREG car which was parked just a few yards away from the station here in a little street where Millie Dowler would have walked past on her way home from school when she was last seen. Now police are very keen to speak to anyone who might have had any involvement in this car that might lead them to the car. There are also fears that the car might have been destroyed. All of this dates back to three years ago now. So the chances that the car might have been destroyed are high but police would also want to speak to anyone who might have been involved in the car's destruction. Police are very keen to follow this lead, which they think might eventually lead them to the killer of Millie Dowler. A 61-year-old man has died after being partially beheaded in a horrific attack in North London. The victim, who was married with children, was attacked with an axe in the Swiss cottage area of the city. A 37-year-old man was arrested at the scene. Detectives don't believe the crime was a random attack or that the suspect has a history of mental illness. I heard just like loads of screaming and shouting and stuff and then I, I got up and went into the living room to see what, what it was like because I could hear it from the street and I looked out and I saw these two guys with like metal bars and they were just like, they looked really kind of panicked. Uh, There's a guy getting arrested, blood on his hands, uh, lots of commotion uh, and basically was arrested and then looked a bit further down the street and there was a body uh, in a pool of blood. Um, few yards down. The condition of premature baby Charlotte Wyatt, who's clinging to life in an oxygen box, has improved. A paediatrician said the 17-month-old baby was more settled and making some facial movements. Doctors won a legal right not to resuscitate her after arguing that she was brain damaged and had no feelings other than continuing pain, a ruling her parents are fighting. Britain's first black cabinet minister is stepping down. Paul Boateng will leave his position.